Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Officers at ease. I want to welcome you, uh, being here this, this afternoon. I've asked that I would open. My name is Sean Oberg, I've been a police officer for over 21 years. I've also been a, a pastor for over 10, a uh, chaplain of Allegheny Police Department. I worked in Olean PD for many years, and I worked in Olean on a two-man team called the Street Crimes Unit. And it was a two-man team. It was undercover, myself and Bob Blofsky. And I, when you understand what it is to remember and honor fellow officers who have given their life in the line of duty. Don't miss what takes place here today, please. Don't miss an opportunity to see honor, loyalty, dignity, faithfulness, courage, bravery. See this for what it is. To honor those who have been courageous in their, in their employment, courageous in their lives to give their life for serving another. Great story in the Bible, a true story about a two-man team. Jonathan was the king's son, the king's son and his armor bearer. And it was a huge privilege to be an armor bearer. An armor bearer was hand-selected by the king and his son. The armor bearer was the one who was courageous in battle. The armor bearer was one who went behind the king's son to protect the sin, to, to protect the son, guard the son. There's a great story that, that Jonathan looked to his armor bearer and said, okay, we're the good guys, the Philistines are the bad guys. And today we're going to go take some Philistines down. And a two-man team goes before the bottom of a hill and looks up and there's a Philistine team of over 20 men. And the Philistines begin to look down and they begin to make fun of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Oh, look, the Israelites came out of their hiding spot. And Jonathan looks to his armor bearer and said, this is our day. And this is what the armor bearer said. I want you to see this. The armor bearer says this. And his armor bearer said to him, this is what he says to, 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 to the king's sons, Jonathan, do all that is in your heart. Turn yourself. And here I am. He says, I don't know how many are on the top of that hill. I don't care how many are on the top of that hill. Sir, if you say we go then we go together. You go, I go. That's the heart of an officer. So many times an officer finds himself in a place that they are outnumbered. Most of the time when an officer comes on a scene, they are not the majority. They are in the minority. At times they're outgunned and outmanned. And here we see this amazing picture of a two-man team. Outnumbered, outgunned, and a place of disadvantage. The armor bearer looks and says, I am with you no matter what, according to your heart. You go, I go. You want to talk about courage? You want to talk about loyalty? You want to talk about bravery? Well, they climbed the hill. And I could just imagine being on a SWAT team, and I could imagine, and in the two-man team, and I could imagine those officers who understand the term execute. When you're standing outside a door and you're ready to hit that door and you know that you've got some bad guys on either side and then there, all of a sudden the commander says, execute. You know there are some bad guys going to jail today. Jonathan looked at his armor bearer and said, there are some bad guys going to jail today. And they climbed the mountain and a two-man team took out over 20 Philistines in a half an acre. That is your front yard. A battle took place that changed the direction of a war because of a two-man team. Today you're going to recognize fallen officers who understand and know the term courage, bravery, understand carrying out a command, understand knowing if you turn around, I'm right here behind you. You go, I go. Today you're going to hear those who understand what it is to hold honor in a high place, 
those who understand what it is to be loyal to your call, and those who have given their life to that very call of what it is to serve people. That's open in prayer. Father, I come before you and I thank you for this opportunity. What a privilege it is to honor those who have fallen in the line of duty, to honor those, God, who's given their lives to serve others. Father, I pray that this ceremony would be one that is full of honor and bravery and courage. This this ceremony is one, God, that is full of one that, that honors you as God. And Father, we pray for the families that you would encourage them during this ceremony. We pray for those who knew the officers, love the officers, God, that you encourage them today. I ask that you would bless this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Today in this room, you see many law enforcement officers. They are just a few of my brothers and sisters that would give their life to protect you. You may only know them as your neighbor, your coach, or even the officer that may have arrested you. You know that I know them as my family, my lifeline when I get in trouble, my salvation when I get in over my head. They are the ones that are that voice right next to me that says, when we will get through this, I have your back. Let's get this done. I truly know that I will do everything in my power to make sure that they get home at the end of our shift. And I know that they will do everything in their power to make sure I get home safely also. Unfortunately, the sad reality is that all police officers do not make it home to their families. This is why in 1962, President Kennedy proclaimed May 15th as National Peace Officers Memorial Day. And the calendar week in which May 15th falls, National Police Week. Throughout this week, we honor our fallen officers, our community heroes, our lost brothers and sisters that gave their lives serving and protecting each and every one of us. Today we honor David Destrola of the City of Bradford Police Department, a loving husband, father, son, brother that was killed in the line of duty and of watch December 23, 1989. We honor Trooper Ross Riley of the New York State Police, a loving husband, son, father. He was killed in, the, in the, a duty training exercise, end of watch, November 20th, 2013. We honor Stephen German of Caneboro Police Department, a loving husband, father, and son that was killed in the line of duty, end of watch, February 20th, 1999. We, offer, we honor Officer Carl Whipple of Johnsonburg Police Department. He was a loving husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and brother that was killed in the line of duty, end of watch, January 17, 1984. We honor Sergeant Perry Barrett of the Salamanca Police Department, a loving husband, father, and son. He was killed in the line of duty, end of watch, August 5, 1982. We honor K-9 Bryson of the Cattaraugus County Sheriff's Department, end of watch, January 24, 2003. We honor Lieutenant Glenn Peters of Chautauqua County Sheriff's Department, end of watch, February 6, 1962. Officer Truman Brooks of the Little Valley Police Department, end of watch, September 8, 1925. Patrolman George Red Kendall of the Jamestown Police Department, end of watch, June 18, 1915. Captain Timothy Hazett, Olean Police Department, end of watch, February 21, 1909. These officers, officers served our community and gave their life for all of us. They are heroes. This is why we honor them today. In continuation of our program, I would like to thank you all in advance for attending and paying your respects to these fallen heroes and their families. The families of these officers need to know that their sacrifice for our community will never be forgotten. At this time, I'd like to show you a short video.
very proud to take on the police officer. Um, I've been doing this job for 15 years, and fortunately, that injury did not end my career. You, as a police officer, you don't want to help. I mean, you're used to helping people. And that's the worst feeling in the world, of feeling that helpful. Our next speaker is Kerrigan Jordan, the president of the Bradford Area High School Criminal Justice Club. Okay, first I'd like to say thank you for them letting me speak today. And last year I had to write a speech. And it had to be a write like of the I Have a Dream speech. And I chose to do mine based on law enforcement because it's very influential in my life. And before I get on with my speech, I'd like to call up the two men that have inspired my speech. First is Officer Butch Bartlett of the City of Bradford Police Department. And next would be my uncle, Chief Robert Shipman of Foster Township Police. Or Bradford Township, sorry. Okay, now I'll get on with it. <laughs> Within these past years, many men and women have gone into the line of duty and have died trying to protect and save the lives of many others, giving us the protective shadow that we stand in today. This momentous act of selflessness gave us a, way, a wave of light of justice and freedom within our nation. Their courage has become a sigh of relief bringing us closer to putting an end to the violence that shatters our country. But now, with the number of fallen officers increasing every day, not all of our criminals have been brought to justice. The life of an officer is sadly causing anxiety, depression, and sorrow within their souls. 
After one has fallen, their fellow officers are stranded in the cold abyss of injustice in a world full of never-ending crime. These men and women need something. They need protection from the dangers of the dark depression and the constant worry of being brutally ripped from their families. I have a dream today. I have a dream that there will be better protection for the ones who give their lives to complete strangers. I have a dream that every fallen officer is properly remembered and actions are taken to help those who have been touched by the wrongdoings of our nation. I have a dream that we will pay more attention to the ones who give their lives to protect us and less to the social media and propaganda that stereotypes these men and women. I have a dream today. I have a dream that every department shall be relieved of their sorrow and every law followed and that we as a nation can live in peace. This is our hope. This is the feelings that I carry with me as I pursue my future goals. With this faith that we will be able to change the world, we will be able to help those who have been wounded. We will be able to grieve with those who are grieving. We will be able to celebrate with those who are celebrating. We will honor our officers the way that they deserve to be honored. This will be the day that a child goes home wondering where her father is. This will be the day that an uncle will never be seen by her niece again. This will be the day that a pregnant wife will go without her husband. This will be the day the forest loses another brother or another sister. Let there be justice from the tip of Maine. Let there be justice from the sandy beaches of Florida. Let there be justice from every crack and bump of the Badlands. Let there be justice from every star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Let there be justice here in our small town communities and here within ourselves. And when this occurs, when we allow justice to simmer in the pot that we know as society, we will let it through every door and window and into every heart and we will know peace. We will be able to go to the day with more justice and less crime, more respect and less hate for all men and women who put their lives on the line every day. The search for the ones who do not follow the same morals and rules we choose to live by and for this they deserve our respect. Let us join together and live the prosperous lives that they help us live and show them our appreciation for the sense of safety and security they provide for us. Thank you. Our next speaker is McKean County District Attorney Raymond Learn. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have the, the privilege to address you today um, in honor of all the law enforcement officers, both locally and across the country, uh, who so valiantly put their lives on the line every day uh, for the protection of total strangers. And I stand before you as a very lucky man. Uh, I'm lucky because I live in a very safe community, uh, thanks to the efforts of the law enforcement here. But I'm also lucky because I have the privilege of working with what I think is, without exaggeration, the finest group of men and women I've ever had the privilege to know. And it's, uh, it's an honor to work with them uh, every day. And I've been working with them for over seven years now, and I've gotten to be friends with many of them. And I've had a chance to ask a lot of them, you know, why is it that you chose to be a law enforcement officer? And one thing I learned is if you ask 10, 10 cops why they became cops, you'll get 10 different answers. But I think what's most telling about them is the answer I never, the answers I don't hear. No police officer has ever told me they do it for the money. They don't do it for glory or fame. They don't do it to exercise control over other people. And the most common answer I get is because they want to help. They just want to help those in their community. And we're here today because the reality is, is that police officers die in the course of their duties. And that is a very sad thing. But for those students that are out here, I want you to think about the positive things that these police officers do. Like I said, their motivation is there to help. And when you're sitting on the berm of the road because you were going too fast, I know it doesn't feel like they're trying to help you right then and there, but they are. And it's their job to protect everybody in our community. And these brave men and women put their lives on the line for people they don't know 
And in reality, they put their lives on the line for some people who don't even like them very much. But that's what they swore to do, and they do it. And as you make your own career decisions, as you decide what you're going to do with your life, I want you to take an example from these law enforcement officers, because they exemplify what is public service. Putting their lives on the line, working swing shifts, working weekends, missing their kids' ball games so they can go help somebody else's children. This is what public service is. And although a career in law enforcement certainly isn't for everybody, I think they teach us all a valuable lesson that it, it's not all about us as individuals, but it's also about our communities and what can you do to help your community. So as you, as you live your lives, take an opportunity to thank a police officer when you see them and take a lesson from their career choice in your lives and think about what you can do for your communities and not just what you can do for yourselves. I always, I always, end, my conver or always end my conversations with the police. I always tell them to be safe because, like I said, I've gotten to be friends with, uh, with many of them and I, I do worry about them. I worry about them all the time because you get to know them as people, not just as officers. And I know they get tired because I'm always poking them in the chest to make sure they got their vest on and then I, I give them a rash of crap if they don't have their vest on and why they should be wearing one. But like I said, what they do is nothing, is, is, is nothing short of uh, miraculous every day because at any given moment they know uh, that they may be called to put their life on the line to save any one of you. And for that, you should say thank you and God bless you all and keep you safe. Our next speaker is President Jeff Shade. Uh, he's Lieutenant Bradford Township Police Department. Um, he's a president with uh, our William Hanley Lodge, number 67. The William Hanley Senior Lodge, number 67, in conjunction with our fellow law enforcement officers, from Pennsylvania and New York State. Thank you all attending our Police Memorial Day ceremony. For paying their respect and honoring our fallen brothers and those officers currently serving every day on our nation's streets. Today we remember our local fallen heroes who have given the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. From our local lodge number 67, Sergeant David L. Bestrola, Bradford City Police Department, Tour of duty ended Saturday, December 23, 1989. He survived by a wife and three children. From our neighboring Bucktail Lodge, Patrolman Stephen Michael German, Kane Borough Police Department. Tour of duty ended Saturday, February 20, 1999. Survived by a wife and two children. Officer Carl Harold Whippo, Johnsonburg Police Department. Tour of duty ended Tuesday, January 17, 1984, survived by his family. We must also remember the lifetime of sacrifices endured by the survivors, the families, the friends, the colleagues of our fallen brothers. Their lives were changed forever. We must ensure that the continued service and sacrifice of our 900,000 law enforcement heroes in our nation whom protect our streets, our communities, and safeguard our democracy, day in and day out are never forgotten. The heroes that are the check stop that maintain a, maintain a democracy and a structured society in our nation we call home. We enforce the law set by our elected officials of our government to keep our community safe. We chose this life, this occupation, we chose to wear these uniforms, to wear these badges, to help people, to keep down evil, and to maintain order, to keep others safe from those that wish to do them harm, or to do harm to our society. We see the bad and evil that some men do upon others. We endure more than 5.2 million violent crimes committed yearly in our nation's streets. We have learned to know that sacrifices that we must give, what we must endure. But we don't always choose the wrath that is purposely targeted at, our, at us and bestowed upon us.
Some suffer the consequences. An average of 160 law enforcement officers have been killed yearly over the last decade. This is one line of duty death every 58 hours. Most officers are killed during arrest situations, disturbances, and car crashes. 40% of the time, an officer is alone or has no backup available when assaulted or killed. More officers fall between 8 p.m. and 12 a.m. than any other time of the day, with the most line of duty deaths falling between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. More officers die in the line of duty on, on Fridays than any other day of the week. An average of two police officers shot every day in the United States. An average of 60,000 police officers are assaulted yearly in the United States. This average is 16,200 injuries to police officers. Many of these injuries lead to career-ending and life-changing disabilities. Injuries and disabilities related to the physical and mental effects of the job. Injuries and disabilities that have adversely affect their lifestyle, their family, and their friends. <clears throat> Some officers make the ultimate sacrifice. 21,747 known peace officers have fallen and given the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. In Pennsylvania history, 803 peace officers have given the ultimate sacrifice. In our neighboring New York State, 1,500 police officers have died in the line of duty. Officers from local departments and communities, Pennsylvania State Police, Olean Police Department, Jamestown Police Department, Little Valley Police Department, Dunkirk Police Department, the Chautauqua County Sheriff's Office, and the Erie County Sheriff's Department, and the New York State Police. Last year, 105 of our brother officers died in the line of duty in our nation's streets. Two more Pennsylvania police officers made the ultimate sacrifice. Patrolman Daniel J.J. Lomax, Forest City Borough Police, survived by a wife, daughter, and several siblings. Patrolman William Jerry McCarthy IV, Shenanango Township Police, and a watch Thursday, May 2nd, survived by a wife, two sons, a daughter, a stepdaughter, and a stepson. New York State fallen officers in 2013 there were six. New York State Trooper David W. Conniff, survived by a wife and two young sons. Trooper Ross M. Riley, survived by a wife and three daughters. Trooper William P. Keene, survived by his wife, seven children, and six grandchildren. Trooper Winston I. Martindale, Jr., survived by his wife, son, and daughter. Detective Charles John Wassell, Jr., Peekskill Police Department, New York, survived by his wife. And police officer Patricia A. Patty Parrott of Buffalo Police Department, and a watch Saturday, February 2nd, 2013. This year, so far in 2014, 42 law enforcement officers have died in the line of duty. Two more police officers from New York State. New York City Police Department, Officer Dennis Guerrera, survived by a wife and four children, and police officer David W. Smith, survived by a young son. In 2013, 17 canines were killed in the line of duty, nine from Pennsylvania, two from New York State. So far in 2014, seven canines were killed in the line of duty. If it wasn't for the bravery and the sacrifice in finding and apprehending bad guys, many more of our officers would die in the line of duty or be injured or killed. We must remember and embrace the survivors, the families, the wives, the husbands, the children, the grandchildren, the parents, the brothers and sisters, the aunts and uncles, the friends and colleagues of the fallen officers. Their lives continue on you onward without their loved ones, a life that has changed forever, the life of, without the protection of a fallen hero. Heroes who gave the ultimate sacrifice to safeguard our streets 
our communities that we call our homes. It is their service that stands between society and people who will do us harm or do us wrong. It is their service that keeps us safe on our streets and safe at our homes at night. God bless all that have fallen for us and paid the ultimate sacrifice. Lest we forget, may they rest in peace.
Thank you, guys. Just in case people did not recognize him, that's Sergeant Erickson on bass guitar, Bradford City Police Department. Our next speaker is Deputy Bob Renfret of the Cattaraugus County Sheriff's Department. Bob is a 38-year law enforcement veteran and a 31-year canine handler. He is currently working with the Cattaraugus County Sheriff's Department and the McKean County District Attorney's Office as a canine handler. Bob is the only officer that is a trainer, a maintenance trainer, and examiner in all of western New York State. Bob handles two canines. One is trained for narcotics detection, and the other one is trained for explosions, explosive de detection. Okay, tracking and patrol work. He is certified through North America Police uh, Work Dogs Association, as well as a National Narcotic, Narcotics Dog Association. I want to thank you for this opportunity and the recognition. Um, Sean made reference of a two-man team when, when he gave his benediction that the, um, well, since the early part of 1983, my two-man team was four legs and a tail. No one understands the bond between the dog and the handler. Um, I don't forget that January 24th, 2003 day on Interstate 86 and um, taking care of a minor accident. And I got an elderly lady out of her car to get her off the, to get her out, off the bridge. And uh, I looked back, here comes an 80,000 pound semi at 70 miles an hour. And I started running off the bridge. And this whole happened in seconds. And I had time to think, and I'm, it's so weird how your brain works. That is, I'm running off the bridge so I don't get smashed by a semi. But this is how my friend Dave Vistrola, um, I knew Dave personally. He'd come to the garage, work on his Jeep. And uh, the same situation on an icy, cold bridge. And, um, but I, it just really means a lot to me. To watch. It's hard to watch these videos for the canine part of this because the dogs have been my whole life for 31 years. And uh, to get the recognition for Bryce's picture, it really means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Timothy Wickham. He's a sheriff in Cattaraugus County in western New York. He is currently serving his 25th year in law enforcement, where he spent seven years working major crimes in Criminal Investigation Bureau. It was in this role that he was recognized as the Blue and Gold Officer of the Year in October uh, 2000. Sheriff Wickham possesses a master's degree in counseling education for St. Bonaventure University and is certified uh, police instructor in the areas of interview and interrogation, basic and advanced juvenile officer training, uh, the investigation of sex crimes, and the law enforcement response to school violence. Sheriff Wickham is a graduate of the 2006 session of the FBI's National Academy and has been specialized training includes uh, crisis neg negotiation with the Los Angeles uh, Police Department's death scene management with the FBI and sex offense seminar with the New York State Police. And he has recently been certified as a SWAT team fitness specialist. Sheriff Wickham has been an adjunct professor for both St. Bonaventure University and Jamestown Community College. He serves as the third vice president for the New York State Sheriff's Association and is a past president of the state of New York Pennsylvania Juvenile Officer Association. Please give him a warm welcome. Good afternoon. I'd like to extend a thank you and my appreciation to the faculty and administration of the Bradford High School for hosting such an important event, especially for giving me the opportunity to address everybody. Keeping in mind that I'm addressing a student body, 
I've put some words together today, and I've tried to form it in a bit of a lesson plan. It is my hope that all of you will leave here today with a better appreciation, education, and understanding of the sacrifices that law enforcement makes. I'd like to start it by having the canine officers out back bring in their dogs to sniff for tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana. I'm just kidding. I wanted to see if someone was going to run. <laughs> You'll find that in law enforcement, in no other profession, humor is a coping skill. And I think we all needed a smile. But now it's time to get serious again. It is so very important to honor and remember those that paid the ultimate sacrifice. They've certainly earned it. Their families deserve it. So I'm glad we're doing it. That being said, August 18th, 2009 was the darkest day in my career. I received a text message from one of my best friends, a fellow law enforcement officer. And he was in trouble. And he died. It was an unnatural death. One I continue to struggle with. And as a police officer, I put my work clothes on. And I've been chasing the culprit ever since, seeking revenge, justice, accountability. I'm still chasing it. It's become a mission of mine. You won't find my friend's picture on this wall because it was not a line of duty death. He killed himself. Now let me explain what that means here today. There are a lot of natural and unnatural manners that are threats to the police. Currently, right now in Cattaraugus County, we have flooding in the west part of our county. We tell everybody to stay inside until it's safe. The police officers can't go inside. We're working side by side with first responders to make it safe for everybody else. The natural disasters that could take police officers' lives can include hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, accidents, traffic accidents, donuts. And we all know some of the real threats are man-made, bad people making bad choices, using weapons, using their hands killing police officers, assaulting police officers. And we face them every day. The traumas that we encourage people to stay away from, to stay home, and to be safe, police officers wade into to eliminate the threat. In doing so, they incur trauma, traumatic events. So my message today, this education you're about to receive, is for each and every one of you, but specifically in the student body, those of you that have ever considered a career in emergency response or the military because you want to protect and serve and help people, because let me tell you, it can be one of the most rewarding and greatest professions there is. I've lived it for 25 years, and I love it. I eat it, I sleep it, I breathe it. But those of you that have considered it, please keep both your ears open for the next 10 minutes. This message is specifically for you, and specifically for my brothers and sisters that are on stage with me today and lining our walls. During the Civil War, officers 
started to realize that some of our soldiers that were exposed to battlefield trauma changed. Some of them started having trouble sleeping. Some of them had higher blood pressure. Some of them had panic attacks, anxiety attacks, eating disorders. Their shorter tempers. They were disconnecting from their friends, disconnecting from their comrades. They weren't quite the same people they were before they waded into battle. For lack of an education, our medical staff and our officers diagnosed those soldiers with something called soldier's heart because it appeared they had a broken heart. And then World War I came along and now we're a better educated society in the fields of psychology, medicine, sociology. And once again we see some of our soldiers exposed to combat and shelling have become different. Not all of them, but some. They weren't quite the same as they were. Panic attack, again, sleeping disorders, eating disorders, shorter temper, excessive alcohol use. They gave it a new name. They called it war neuroses or shell shock. You want to jump on the internet later and type those words in, you will see pictures of soldiers that appear to have a thousand yard stare. It was a trademark symptom. You may be talking to this soldier, you may even make the soldier laugh, but in reality the soldier is looking right through you because they put up a defense wall. Their constitution has been challenged because of the trauma that they were exposed to and they are disconnected in some ways trying to preserve their safety, psychologically, emotionally. World War II comes around. Again, we're better educated. Now we're documenting the symptoms. We see the pattern. There's a, there's a trend developing that's being noticed. So we give it a new name, combat fatigue syndrome. And we really started getting our stuff together because now we're monitoring the symptoms, and we're going to address the symptoms and start treating these soldiers. And there's a very famous incident that occurred with a very famous general when we started treating soldiers for combat fatigue syndrome. General Patton, those of you that are history majors, and General Patton is visiting soldiers in the infirmary and he's congratulating them and handing them medals. What happened to you, son? I got shot in the back. Here's your medal, thanks for your service. What happened to you, son? I got hit with shrapnel. Here's a medal. Thank you for your service. What happened to you, son? General, I don't know. The shelling starts happening and I start to panic. I lose control of my breathing. I wet myself. I can't sleep. I have a shorter temper. I hyperventilate. I pass out. And the general slaps this soldier so hard it knocks him out of his cot. The general demands the orderly to remove this soldier from the infirmary because he is a disgrace to the true American soldiers who have real injuries. General Patton does this twice, ladies and gentlemen. He loses a star for it. He gets demoted. Eventually he gets the star back and leads a successful campaign. Our government, our military, did not embrace treating psychological and emotional pain. Police agencies are paramilitary. We are structured after the government. We still have General Patton's as chiefs, sheriffs, lieutenants, sergeants, and officers. We have work to do. Because the Vietnam conflict taught us even more. Our soldiers exposed to combat, again, started to manifest changes in their quality of life. The same changes I've already mentioned. And now we're documented, and now we know it can be treated. That's what we've learned so far in Vietnam. And we gave it a new name, post-traumatic stress disorder. It is still with us today. It is in the DSM-5. It is the manual that psychologists, psychiatrists, clinicians will use when they sit down and talk with you and try to identify if you're manifesting something that's robbing you of your quality of life. It's a disorder, psychological disorder. Vietnam put it on the map. Our soldiers coming back from Vietnam were not treated very well. They were jeered at. There were protests. It was not a popular conflict. 
None of them were screened for PTSD, but those that started to exhibit signs and symptoms started to get treatment, and our nation has learned how to successfully treat PTSD. We're currently at war again, Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, every soldier upon return is getting screened for PTSD. I would suggest to you that the system is still flawed. Picture yourself in a foreign country with a rifle for 13 months, having your life in danger dozens of times, watching horrific death and tragedy and chaos all around you when everything you love is back home here. And when it comes time for you to get home, you sit down with a therapist who's asking you if everything's okay. Will you be tempted to give the right answers to get home faster? The answer is yes. Let me demonstrate to you just how young PTSD is in our society. Those of you in the red chairs, the student body, if you heard me use the word postal, I think you all know what I mean. Somebody went postal. You're all going to start thinking about this fella or lady that shot some of their coworkers, tried to shoot at the police, maybe got killed by the police, maybe ended up killing themselves. You think of this violence when you use the word postal. And my guess is almost all of you have no idea where the word came from. If I look to some of the older people who have receding hairlines or gray hair in the room, everybody's trying to hide now. Those of you remember where it came from. Because postal workers went to work and shot their, co shot their co-workers, sometimes shot themselves. It didn't happen one time. It didn't happen twice. It happened a handful of times during a window of time. And then guess what? It stopped. Why did it stop? It happened enough that we have a word for it that our younger generation knows, but none of the younger generation knows where the word came from because we're not having those things happen at postal offices anymore. You know, the U.S. Postal Service is a civil service employer, just like police agencies. Veterans who serve in the military get preferential points on civil service exams. And those incidents that occurred that derived the word postal came from combat veterans from Vietnam with untreated, undiagnosed PTSD who lost their battle. The reason we haven't had one in a long time is because Vietnam was a long time ago. But if you pay attention right now, every now and then on the news, you will see a troubling story with a veteran who returned home and became violent. Violent acts perpetrated by people with PTSD are rare. It's a rare symptom. But it's a real one. Our soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, depending on where you get your stats right now, have about a one in two chance of coming home manifesting PTSD. 50%. That's an astonishingly high number. Our general population, if you go down to the mall, you sit on a bench and you count 100 people from the general population, you can estimate that four of them have PTSD. 4%. Our soldiers coming home, 50%. And here you go, ladies and gentlemen. The stats for cops, 24% because of repeated exposure to trauma. So take a look around the room. It's one out of four. If you go home tonight and you dial 911, you got a one in four chance that the officer showing up to help you at your darkest hour is quietly suffering from PTSD, which we know now is a 100% manageable disorder. But our society is still squeamish about emotional and psychological pain, especially in the paramilitary institution where you're supposed to suck it up and be tough. PTSD has a lot of negative side effects. Alcoholism, higher incident rates of divorce, high blood pressure, sleep disorders, life expectancy. 
You saw a stat on your PowerPoint earlier that said the average life expectancy for a U.S. police officer is 55. That's not just because of the man-made and natural disasters that take our officers' lives. It's because of post-traumatic stress disorder. The average life expectancy for a U.S. male is 72.4 years. For police officers, depending on where you get your stats, it's 56 to 59. It's like a 14-year swing. And you consider those of us that become police officers in the academy have to be in the elite 20% of the population, sit-ups, push-ups, running, psychological exams, and you're signing up for a career that's going to kill you 14 years earlier than the rest of the population. I hope you're paying attention to the sacrifices that these ladies and gentlemen make. I hope you leave here with it today. I hope you choose to help us make our community safe. We're depending on you to do that. My brothers and sisters in law enforcement, my message to you today is in order to protect and serve, you must first protect and serve yourself and your brother and sister law enforcement officers. Sometimes the people that need help are closer than you think. Be safe. Thank you. I hope we've heard what you've had to hear from today. That you leave this place understanding a little bit more about honor and dignity, loyalty, bravery, and courage. And that you allow your character to define who you are and what you do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this afternoon and thank you for a time that we have remembered those with a great place of dignity and honor. Father, we pray for those who desperately struggle with so many different things in their heart and in their minds. God, I ask that you would bring a great rest to those and great peace to those through the counseling and through the help, God. And Father, we just ask that you would continue to show officers and law enforcement, men and women, wisdom, discernment. Father, you would protect those in uniform. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Student body, we thank you for your attentiveness. Thank you for attending.